And then he went straight in and we were like, what's your worst day on service? And I just fucking got transformed back to being that kid again. Sat in a DC whilst Richie's on a stretcher and we're trying to scoop sick out of his mouth and doing CPR on him. And it just took me straight. And every time I get this emotion and it overrides me, it just takes me back to that same scenario. I just zoom back in. Yeah. I thought I was taking ostrogen, like a psalm, to help with recovery. But it turns out it wasn't that. I don't even know what I actually got done for. Because honestly, if I'm honest, mate, I was sat in my basement with a bit of rope ready to go. Really? Yeah, I was like, it fucking hit me up because I was like, I fucked up and I didn't mean to and I just did it for you know all intents and purposes I didn't want to let people down no. if you got a disability 10 years ago in a wheelchair that was like they almost like I was your life over wasn't it whereas now it's like we said the, the world's changed so much in the last five years you've got all this adaptive sport you've got grassroots level sport now where people can go and train in a gym and just have fucking purpose I always say in the gym it doesn't have to be destructive to be productive and people are like, oh, that's a really cool saying, Ben. Who came up with that? I'm like, I'm pretty sure I've come up with that. <laughs> if there's anybody out there that can tell me otherwise, but I've been using it for the last four or five years. But it doesn't have to be destructive to be productive. You don't have to absolutely end your life or be in a ball of mess to actually have some benefit from that session. <laughs> First of all, what I want to say is Mark made me cut my mullet off. So whatever happened after that was his own fault. Yeah, right? that, game, was, mate. that was a child. That was a wonderful life. mullet you had. Two, well. two years it took me to grow that. And it was <laughs> right at the right time because Jerk Exotic came out and everybody's like, Ben, you've already got a mullet. I was like, oh no, it's fucking cool as fuck. <laughs> <laughs>
Are they still like it now? No, it's the, the, the approach of the Royal Marines is completely different. They're a real professional force and they, they'll educate rather than thrash. Whereas I found like when I was a recruit, if you messed up, you just got thrashed and punished. Which you don't learn nothing from that truly. You just are fearful not to do anything wrong. So you don't take risks or you don't think outside the box because you're so scared of doing something wrong. You might be a leopard crawling in your shirt and trousers up and down the mud bank and then having an inspection 20 minutes later. Which is an, an impossible task, right? You know? And it's always an impossible task. So you just get thrashed again. So it's one of those things where the modern era of Royal Marines are far better soldiers and educated than I was when I was a recruit in those first few years after passing out. What do you think caused that change? Uh, I just think the modern world, you don't, it's, 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 a, different, it's a different world, mm -hmm. you know, and that educational system of, there's a lot more information out there about coaching and mentoring and like, uh, how to approach and how to teach. Whereas the military is finally caught up with that. Whereas before there was that old school approach of thrashing. And then the next generation come and they get thrashed, but they also understand the, the importance of education and it slowly changes the more and more information, the more and more education people get like, all right, we can thrash them to a point, but we still need to get an objective and teach them <laughs> yeah. something at the end of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. And and why did you so, uh, decide to join the Marines opposed to the Army or the Air Force? Uh, my granddad was in the Army. So obviously, first of all, I had to up, up one up him. You know, God right. rest his soul. I was like, <laughs> oh, my granddad was um, my hero growing up, my, my father figure as such. Um, and he always spoke highly of his military career. Um, I moved to Spain to try and rekindle a relationship with my father which was uh, disastrous and I haven't seen him for, since then either. But so I came home and I remember I sat there, I was working as a, uh, in Safeway making pizzas and I saw the Royal Marines advert, you know, when he gets his foot caught in the tunnel in the underwater trap. I don't know if you ever remember it. It was like, yeah, would so. you stop here? And his boot stuck and he's like <laughs> under the water and it goes, no. And then he like gets his boot free and he comes out the other side of the water tunnel. I was like, that's cool. That's what I want to be. And I told all my school, I told all my schoolmates, like, I'm going to go join the Marines and everybody just laughed. <laughs> I mean, they, you ain't got that, Ben. You've got no discipline, you know? And I was like, no, I'm doing it. I'm going to go and join the Marines. Were you quite an athletic kid? Yeah, I was, I was an athletic kid. I was good at rugby. I played, you know, county level and um, beyond. I had selection for South West England when I was a child. I wasn't the greatest rugby player in the world, but I was always fit. You know, I would always be first at cross country. I'd played every sport for the school. I'd play tennis. I'd play football. I'd, I'd do everything. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was like a fit kid, yeah. Yeah, I guess that'll help then, right? Yeah, that's big yeah. help. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I liked exercise. I liked, I liked running around. I think yeah. that was who I was meant to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah perfect. And I've, I've, I've known a few lads over the years that have been in the Royal Marines, and I hear stories about like initiations mm. from the other lads. Is that something that you experienced at all? Yeah, yeah. I've been on the receiving end and I've been in charge of them. Okay, so, can you tell us about them or is it, uh, is it Yeah, I can tell you. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you about them. They are... Um, for all intended purposes, they're like a, a welcome to the to the Royal Marines. Um, rubbish haircuts, drinking games. There has been joining runs in the past that have gone above and beyond what any human being should have to endure. And there is <laughs> things that I probably will never ever speak about that has happened <laughs> because it happened. It's not the end of the world. Um, but it's one of those things that at the time when I was joining the Marines, it was the rite of passage. Um, you had to, you know, until you'd done a joining run, you weren't a boot neck basically. Um, but, Later on in my career, we were doing the joining runs and they also happened to get toned down because of the media, mobile phones. People started filming them and the outside world went, that's not normal. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Which it isn't normal. When you look back on some of it, I reflect. So what, like, what would you have to do if you don't uh, make joining runs? Like, you know, we'd make you, if you were like eating something and you were sick, you'd have to be sick into your oppo's face and mouth, like for instance. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, that, that was one of the rules. You couldn't just be sick anyway. You had to be sick on an oppo because obviously your oppo was looking after you. Then you would be like, you know, we used to do the triage challenge where you get blocks of butter, um, fish oil, and you'd put it into milk and beer and it would curdle it. So you'd have to eat a block of butter, five Jacob's crackers, pint of milk, four Jacob's crackers, pint of beer, whilst trying to hold it down, you know, and it, it, it'd just be projectile vomiting everywhere. So kind of fun, kind of not, you know what I mean? <laughs> How's that compared to your football stories, mate? A bit worse? <laughs> I don't know, some of the, some of the football ones are pretty bad, yeah, mate. I mean, yeah. Rugby, football, rugby, yeah. Yeah, rugby, yeah, rugby is rugby about is the really closest great. I've ever got to like yeah. initiation. Maybe not that bad, but yeah, pretty bad, mate. Yeah, what was the worst, what was the worst thing you ever saw during those sort of things? Uh, you know what, that's, uh, that, the worst, I'm not going to say the worst thing because it's not probably appropriate for, uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's definitely not appropriate for uh, people to hear, but, you know, getting shot with BB guns and air rifles was always, always one. You had to hard target. 
So there was like, you had to do a lap of the block. And if you didn't hard target enough, you just, lads would be stood there with air rifles, BB guns, and just vetting you up as you run past. So you'd have to hard target, obviously practicing for deployment or whatever. <laughs> so you didn't get caught up, like, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. quite fun. Yeah, yeah. seems like good yeah, practice, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, how about your overseas operations? Did you do much of that? I guess you joined during the conflict, you said, right? Yeah, I went, uh, I was in Afghanistan on 2000, I was, you know, 17 years ago. I was rich. He is actually one of my friend's anniversaries yesterday. Um, so we had a table laid out at the Christmas dinner, but 17 years ago since I was, uh, in Afghanistan which just it blows my mind and it only feels like you know yesterday I could have sat there and looked at his name card on the table I could smell and feel the the overwhelming emotions of being back there like you know yeah. what I mean mm -hmm. you, you know ultimately we're all we're all kids and I don't know if you've seen photos of me on Instagram when I was out there my head was three times bigger than the rest of my body <laughs> and I just didn't look like I belonged there with a fully automatic belt fed machine gun right you know, <laughs> yeah. you know? So it was um, it's crazy isn't it? yeah yeah so I did Afghanistan I've done numerous trips around the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, um, all those kind of places. I've done the jungle, Norway's. Um, so yeah, been, I've pretty much been everywhere yeah. with the military. Um, yeah, it's been good. Yeah, because you, you mentioned at the start that you joined sort of during a, a time where there was stuff going on. Because I've, I've heard from other lads as well, they've been in and there's just, it's just been nothing going on. Do, do you, despite obviously all the shit that went on overseas, do you, do you, would you prefer to think, thinking back that it was action opposed to not? That makes sense. Oh yeah, good question. Um, oh, do you know what? I don't tend to think back on these kind of questions because what's done is done now. It's like the old egg question: Would you go back and change anything? Well, I can't. So what is? Yeah. What is? You know, what we did is we went out there for each other. Um, the political agenda is never mine or yours pay grade ultimately um, and you know deep down should we have ever been in Iraq and Afghanistan? Pff, absolutely not. No. You know what I mean? Definitely not. Yeah. Well, it wasn't worth the juice is not worth a squeeze evidently because you know, we just walked away from them and left it, right? Yeah. yeah. What I mean, which is no, quite sound. No, it's no fucking difference. No, it made no difference. Other than the, all it's done is affect quite a few generations of young men from this, our country that have been left with traumatic nightmares and injuries and God knows what else. And that's the, the sad part of it all is that you, the sacrifice that you make actually isn't warranted. Like it, it didn't make any difference in the long run, mm -hmm. which is quite sad, if I'm honest. No, you're right, mate. It is. It's shit. And how about your proudest moment, mate, from the military? What would that be? I think becoming a Royal Marine was pretty much one of the, it's, it's one of those things where I don't know, you know, becoming something and making it is the, the best thing. After you've become it, it's like, oh, I'm in. I'm in. You know what I mean? Cutting downtown, think I'm the hardest bloke this side of them in Japan, but you're not. I you're just another bloke, you know? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think passing out, you know, you know, given, you know, circumstances of, childhood and background you know we weren't poor I mean, we weren't rich people you know my mum's my mum's an angel having to stick with me for the last 38 years or 37 years so she deserves a medal um because i was a difficult child so for me having actually completed that and having a sense of pride and achievement was probably the first time in my life that I'd actually ever gone through with something and finished it i didn't even do all my gcse's so i just didn't go to school you know um so yeah i think that passing out as a war marine was obviously uh, absolutely incredible and then becoming a physical training instructor like a PTI was you know pretty much up there as well if I'm honest because that's a, another thing that you want to become and then you become it right yeah, yeah. and it, was that always was that always what you wanted to do was it always a PTI uh, or did you just fall into that how does that typically happen I don't know I don't know I don't I can't really remember but one of the one of my biggest inspirations in there was um, it was our troop PTI it was called Glyn McNary and it just so happened that he lived like two doors down from my mum when I was a recruit and I used to see him at Bobman. I was like, you're right, corporal. He's like, don't call me corporal on Civvy Street. You can call me Glenn today. And I'd be like, yeah, all right, staff. Like, ah, <laughs> don't call him his first name. I think when I was a recruit, like on one leave, I was meant to meet him on a Sunday morning for a 10 mile run, but I trapped and didn't go. And we got thrashed that week by another PTI because someone in the troop didn't stick to one of the meetings with our PTI. <laughs> I was like, I didn't say a word ever. <laughs> Did you not? No, I just kept, no. <laughs> Head down that. Just don't say, all week don't look it. at, don't look at people. But he was a big inspiration in my life. Um, and we deployed on Afghanistan. He was one of the section commanders when I was a young Marine on Herrick 5 with K Company. Um, he went on to eventually be badged and um, lost a leg out in Afghanistan, actually, I think on his on deployment. But he was a PTI and, I looked up to him. So I think meeting him and we became close friends because we lived quite close together. We were 
based again. And I think he was my sort of inspiration, like my father figure as such to go and become a PTI. Mm. Um, and then from then, when you get a bug for something, you got to want to eat, sleep and breathe it. And then you can go and be it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. And how about when you were overseas and obviously we, we know there were just obviously tons of fucking lads who, who lost fucking limbs and, and obviously their lives. Was there any ever near misses for you? Were you ever in a situation you're like, fuck, I'm done, this is it? <laughs> well, yeah, I think like, you know, I've, uh, we were in, I think the day Richie died, it was like massive contact. And I remember like two RPGs, like rocket propelled grenades, just going past us. Like, and it was like saving Private Ryan. You've seen saving Private Ryan where it goes into slow mo on the beach and everything's like weird. For, and you, you see one of the soldiers run up the beach. And that's genuinely what actually happened. I just watched and then watched and then they exploded. And then you're like, fuck, back in. And started re engaging the, 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 the targets, like, you know. And it was, um, yeah, it was surreal experiences if I'm honest yeah it must be yeah it must be you just must not process what's going on the no. severity of what's going on as well I just right? think as like a kid from the western world you're not you're not built for destruction and chaos and, and death no. which no, is not, not because you know even if you're a criminal in this country you still have a value of life you can't just go and kill them right because yeah. you then become the criminal you yeah. know what I mean so every life has value but you know in a place like that and Afghanistan and the Middle East life is cheap and that's a true true representation of it like life's cheap I don't care you know and you know and that's the the sad fact of it that the reason why men like us and people from and women as well that get affected by it is because we're just from a different walk of life you know yeah how were you received by the civilians out there uh, from what I remember you know what I mean we, a lot of the areas that we were in there wasn't a mass amount of civilians they'd evacuated the areas and they didn't live in those areas because of the, the conflict itself. Um, you know, we had a lot of interpreters work with work, work with us, which were really cool, nice guys. And they had families that were in Kabul and stuff like that. And they were really good. And I think as a whole, some of the, there was a split opinion. Some people like Labour, some people like the Conservatives, you know what I mean? And they both live in the same country. It doesn't mean that, you know, one person hates the other, you know yeah. what I mean? They, one person's favours the Taliban and one person didn't, you know? So it's their own personal, choice on that you know one man's terrorist another man's freedom fighter i suppose you know but you know at points good i never or we never had any bad interactions with yeah. the civilian world over there yeah fair one and just uh, to kind of like the mood a little bit funniest moments you must have a few oh yeah jesus christ what well, uh <sighs> so swifty uh, we had an 84 which is a uh, rocket launcher um, the contact I told you about with the RPGs, it was uh, like quite heavy. And Swifties pulled our knee and pulled his rocket out. And Hutch, a section commander, like knelt down behind it. And uh, he's fucking hit this, hit this rocket off. And Hutch is in the blast. And he's on the floor like, ah. And it's like, <laughs> ears are ringing. And uh, obviously they're like, it's, it's, you know, it isn't funny, but it is funny at the same time. And um, we get back to the compound. We're, we're just chatting about it. The next day we go out on patrol and Swifty's got a new AT4 and he's like, uh, Hutch, just read the back of the rocket and he's written it. <laughs> Hutch, don't stand here on permanent marker. <laughs> it's just a little things in life, yeah, isn't it? you yeah. know what I mean? Before you go back out on, out, out on the ground. But you have moments of um, what funniness or, or like, <laughs> um, you know, they were dropping bombs and a bit of shrapnel landed right next to one of our lads and they're like, fucking hell, contact fag contact fag you just get a fag out and you're like oh, that was close <laughs> there was always a rush to who as soon as you go into contact you could get behind the wall and get a cigarette out first to start smoking it whilst you're getting the rounds back down so yeah it was fun yeah so <laughs> fun times but funny when you reflect back on it like, yeah you know, it's fucking mad that you can find those funny moments in that fucking situation you know you've got to yeah I think you've got to yeah yeah, yeah. Sure. It's, like, it's like it's like anything in life and if whatever something's tough it's like you know swimming in the sea every week when it's seven degrees or six degrees you you've got to laugh sometimes and find a bit of humour out there because else it's just miserable. That's fucking miserable. Yeah, because it's cold yeah. and wet, right? Freezing. Yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely, mate. And I don't know if you've done an interview since this, but obviously it was that clip of you, mate, when you did the um, interview with the Veteran Foundation and they caught mm. you off guard a little bit. What what kind of your reflections on that, thinking back to that kind of moment and that going out? How, how do you feel about it now? Uh, I had the video for about three months before they, and I was quite embarrassed about it. If I'm if the truth be honest, I was quite embarrassed. I watched some of it back when they sent it to me and I was like, I, you know, I, I looked quite beef in, in my own opinion. I was like, <laughs> fucking hell, that's, I just look like, I look bad. <laughs> right. But they were like, you know, talking to me saying, no, you should, it's a powerful message. You should, you know, go out. So I sent it to Mark Rammers, Omrod, you know, Mark, sent it to Mark and I sent it to a friend, like an ex-bootneck friend up in London. And I'd, 
FaceTime with other after they watched it and Amy's missus was sat there crying and I was like, you're right. They're like, yeah, that's powerful, that video. So, you know, long story short, Mark was like, I was like to Mark, do you think I should let it go out? And he was like, yeah. Um, and obviously it went out. It was uh, a hard watch. Um, it was, yeah, hard hard watch for me to watch back, if I'm honest. Mm. You know, uh, a lot of emotions. It's just, they just caught me off guard. And I wasn't, they gave me a list of questions like you guys have given me. Yeah. And then he went straight in with like, what's your worst day on service? And I just fucking got transformed back to being that kid again. Sat in a DC whilst Richie's on a stretcher and we're trying to scoop sick out of his mouth and doing CPR on him. And it just took me straight. And every time I get this emotion and it overrides me, it just takes me back to that same scenario. I just zoom back in and I'm back there. You know what I mean? And then, you know, obviously the rest of the uh, interview from there was like emotionally charged. So when you're, you got us down, you're emotional. You probably speak a little bit more honestly sometimes, you know? Yeah, it was, it, it, mate, it was, it was powerful for sure. I, I've watched it, mate, and it, it got me going, mate. And then the response I, I take it from that has been, been really positive, it's, I imagine. It's been overwhelming. Is it? Um, it's been quite challenging, if I'm honest, because, you know, uh, I've, I had friends from the Marines ring me I haven't seen for 10 years and on the phone crying, and I'm like, fuck, man, people need help. Yeah, fuck um, it. I, mean, I must have received probably 20,000, I'm not even joking, 20,000 Instagram or Facebook messages within a week. Uh, it was really overwhelming for me, and I actually was quite it was quite detrimental to me uh, to start with because I was like... Getting, well, it's been a lot to deal with. I just felt, yeah. I felt getting burdened. Yeah. You know, but there was a lot of positivity that came out for me that men that I looked up to in the Marines messaged me saying, well done, mate, that was fucking awesome. Do you know what I mean? Because ultimately most of the people that have been deployed and done things have got these inner problems and these similar feelings. But it's like I tell you a story in 2011, there was a, I won't say his name just in case, but... He was an ML at the time and he was going for a real bad place. Um, and I was on the PT staff at the time and I was basically drinking every day. Um, I was out of the piss all the time. Uh, I got into a lot of trouble with the police. I was going for, and, you know, luckily I had a sergeant major that sat down and talked to me one day and I just broke down into tears to him. And I sat on Christmas, I was on Christmas camp on my own there just drinking, contemplating why I want to even be on this earth, if I'm honest. And um, me and this guy used to see each other on camp because we were friends from Afghanistan, Herrick Five, and you'd be like, you're right, boy, like that, a bit of like, like that every single day, but he tried to take his life during that period. And, you know, I was sat there in the grot on Christmas Day on my own with the same sort of feelings, um, which was, and he didn't call me until that video had gone out. And I was on the phone on the way home and he called me. And I was like, fucking hell, what's he calling me for? And he just opened up and we chatted, which was like, it was, it was massive. Because we just spoke about that period of our lives. And it was like, it's quite powerful that someone you'd known for 17 years that would just call you and just go, wow, what was, and just start talking. And the amount of conversations I've had with my bootneck mates over food and that, that have actually gone, oh, I'm a bit struggling here with this. And it's like, you know, we've been years, some of those boys have been friends for 15 years and we've never ever once spoke about anything. Yeah. Not once. <laughs> you know, not, no one's yeah. ever said, oh man, I'm hurting from that. No, yeah. It was a bad day. I'm upset yeah. from that. Not, not once, never until this video went out, which is like, been, it's been good because obviously I feel like, other people are talking about their problems, but it was also burdened. I feel like it's not burdened me because that's not that's the wrong word because it's a privilege for people to reach out and express their emotions to you because they trust you or whatever. But you still absorb those emotions. It's been it? hard, mate. Yeah, it's been really, really hard. If I'm honest, it's, uh, it's opened up. I've got a lot of can of worms. Yeah, no, that's brilliant though, mate. And uh, I mean, with blokes in general, there's always been a stigma, isn't there, about fucking talking and stuff. And yeah. I, I feel with the military lads, it's maybe sometimes worse because... It's so hard for anybody that hasn't been through that to, to even begin to understand. I mean, coming out of the military, mate, was there much kind of support for, for mental health? Was it talked about much when you left? No, I so I, I basically had to go to like um, a basket weavers course and uh, anger management classes and drink classes when I was in the military. And then I was in DCMH Drake um, going through like that sort of um, recovery. Yeah. Um, which was which was great for me at the time because it gave me an avenue of not, I stopped drinking for a long period of time when I was in the military, which gives its, <laughs> you know, in the culture of the Marines and the other British forces, telling people you're not going to drink is a challenge in itself. Right? <laughs> uh, and, you know, um, but yeah, I, I kind of got help and kind of got back to a place where I was okay. But I, I just don't think you ever really let go of these feelings, if I'm honest. It's like, you know, I had Richie's table place and I sat there having dinner and I look over and I'm going to get emotional. I'm like, fucking hell, it's 17 years ago. Surely by now I can I can let it go, but perhaps not. You know, maybe I don't want to. You know, you never know, dear. But yeah, it's been. And then I left the military and like near nothing. And I say I say that like I say that from the organisational point of view. You know, the Royal Marines has never once called me and gone, "Hey, how's civil life treating you? Are you okay?" 
as an organisation. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. Yeah. You know, my you know, my oppos, I said that in my veterans lottery video, right? And a lot of my oppos are like, oh sorry, I haven't called you for six months. And I'm like, but it's I wasn't aiming that at you because you are what makes the Royal Marines is the oppos and the men next to you looking after you and the love that you have for each other is is what makes the Royal Marines so special. It's not the organization, it's not the people in charge of it. It's the the men and now potentially women that'll be to the left and right of you. Right? That's what makes it so special. And those boys call me and speak to me all the time. But I meant as an organizational standpoint, they've never really ever asked. I find that mental though, isn't it? Because of what boys like you go through and then just going, yep, see you there, but gone. And then all the struggles that everyone knows that people have after seeing that sort of trauma and then getting no sort of help and then having to deal with it. It's, it's fucking, it, it is mental, isn't it? it is that, that is mental. Yeah, uh, but I think like you said, mate, even with joining the military, I think time's moving on quite rapidly now, isn't it? And I think people just generally speaking are a lot more aware of mental mental health struggles and everything else. Whereas I think maybe in the past, like when did you leave? What year? Uh, t- well, 10 years ago next year, so 2014. Yeah. It's scary, isn't it? Yeah, I'm <laughs> getting old. I know, mate. <laughs> but if you think about just, you know, sort of general society in, in that period of time, it's massive. Not a lot, like it? The last 10 years is like... Mate, I'd changed. say the last like five years. Yeah, five years. Five years. Five it's years. gone through the roof, yeah, hasn't it? The world's know? changed. It's a different beast nowadays, isn't it? Yeah. Like, and it's great that, you know, men are feeling more confident to talk. I still don't think it's it's, it's good enough. Um, you know, uh, you know, the mental health waiting list is like 18 months to see someone on the NHS at the moment. Is it? Something like that. Fuck yeah. It. So we've been doing an initiative with the gym and trying to train people in the park to help with that because some people might just need exercise on that 80 month wait yeah. list and they might find themselves again or whatever. But, you know, I know we're digressing from the military, but, you know, if it wasn't for companies like uh, charities, not charities, Rock to Recovery isn't a charity. So I'll say that now. But uh, organizations like Rock to Recovery, um, Jamie Sanderson founded it with Jamie Fox. We know Foxy from SAS Two Dares Wins. They founded that, and Jamie Sanderson. I went through DM- DCMH Drake at the same time. Actually, we're both seeing uh, people at DCMH Drake, which is the mental health team in Drake at the same time. And he was um, a, a reconnaissance troop. Uh, I was in with Herrick Five with him. He was a sniper, and he's you know pretty cool guy. And he started Rock to Recovery, and they're phenomenal. You know, if I get people from the military messaging me like hanging out. I'm like, I call Carly or the team and I'm like, hey, this guy's hanging out. Here's his number. And within 24 hours, they've contacted him. Within 24 hours of that, they're seeing someone, yeah, which is that's like, great, it, it? it's, it's phenomenal because for me, it's like, if people have to wait, then the problem with like yeah. people, especially people from the military, they're determined, especially Royal Marines, they're determined people. And if you can't catch them quick enough and they've set their minds to something, they are pretty determined people and they'll go and do something and yeah. that's why we've seen it recent last 10 years i think there's more people died from suicide than ever died in afghanistan at the moment for especially in my my generation of marines yeah yeah shit mate um we've had a number of guests on and we've had a few different opinions around sort of how to tackle men's mental health and, and this is more sort of generally speaking now but we've had you know the the, the kind of group who think you know talking's the answer and we kind of touched on that already and i agree with you that i think it, it's great to have that as an option to people, but it probably isn't enough in itself. And then we've had, you know, one side where they think it's the responsibility of men to to be a bit more accountable and 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 take action. And then we also had a guest who felt it was more of a societal problem. Um that society needs to change to better support men and stop disadvantaging men. Have you got any thoughts on on where the potential sort of fix is? Good question. I think the problem starts with a stiff upper lip, right? You know what I mean? That British tradition is like, you know, comes back from World War Two, doesn't it? I guess that you just it was a stiff upper lip and you cracked on, right? And I think that 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 needs to be changed. That fundamental underpinning of of why. And it's it's like the Marines, right? You don't want to ever go train. You don't want to get injured. You don't want to go sit bay. You don't want to ever tell anybody you're hurting. You're taught not to do that or not show emotion. That's what they tell you to do. And you don't ever, even if your fucking foot's fallen off, lads be like, nah, I'm not going sit bay. I'm like, mate, you've lost three toes. Nah, I'll be all right. I can carry on with my commando test next week. Do you know what I mean? That's the kind of like, that's that's what you get drilled into from the very beginning in the, in the military side of things. Of course, people don't go and talk. Yeah, it must be so hard after. Imagine that, yeah. Yeah, you, you've, you've just, you've been broken down and you never want to go to sick bay. You never want to be the person that goes into sick bay or, get, or get, gets ill or gets injured. You just don't want to be that person, right? And then they wonder why people won't talk to each other. Mm. I don't. I don't know what the. I don't know what the answer is. If I'm honest, mate. I, I. You know what? I don't know. For me, exercise has always been one of the greatest gifts that I've ever had, and it's the one thing that I found solace in. No matter through the good times, the bad times, 
that exercise has always been there for me. It's been the most consistent thing in my life other than my my now wife. You know what I mean? They're the only two and, and 10 years in the military. It's about the most, three most consistent things I've ever had uh, outside of family, right? You know? Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. I think I think exercise is a key one. Shared hardship. We say it all the time, yeah. but yeah. Shared hardship. Jiu-Jitsu is a great example. Open water swimming is a great example. Joining the military is a great example. CrossFit. CrossFit's CrossFit a great yeah. example. You do hard shit together. You empathize with each other. Your emotions are up. Your boundaries are down. People normally talk a little bit more. We've got a swim group that swims every Sunday down at Devil's Point. And the friendships that have been built out of that group from different demographics of like the military, the civil world, etc. It's been, it's, it's, for me, it's like quite, it's an honor and privilege to sit back and watch. Yeah. Because you get all these people from different demographics that probably might not meet, but they go out in the sea when it's rough as hell. You're drinking about 10 tons of water at six degrees or seven <laughs> degrees, right? And you still get out smart and have a coffee and have a great yeah. chat. So those, you know, it's, it's the same as jujitsu, isn't it, right? Who wants to have another bloke sat on their face, smothering them to death pretty much? But there's something that does that. And it, what, the, I don't know, that, that shared hardship, I always find if we could give people hardship again, you'd value things more because the problem is life's relatively easy nowadays and you can be comfortable your whole life. Yeah, you haven't got to do anything if you don't want to. No. You, know, you can go to an office job, come home, do no exercise, eat shit. And then you, and you wonder why you're depressed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Wonder why the men aren't talking because they're, you know, they're sat at home on the laptop working from home now or not exercising. You know, my father was a great example. Fucking great guy. Works his ass off. He's just found tennis. He's like, it's changed my life. I'm like, if you're exercising and socializing, you know what I mean? He's changed his life. And I'm like, simples. Yeah. And how much better do you feel as well if you're just physically fit? Yeah. You, like, just mentally, you feel better. You feel better about yourself. You wake up in the morning, you're not sluggish. You're just fucking happy, isn't you? You know, wants to do it every day. It's no. fucking hard. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. That's the idea of it. It's rewarding when it's hard, you know? Yeah, mate, I think that's, I think you're right. I think the key, the key is exercise. And we've talked about it so much, haven't we? Yeah. Um, on, on the note of exercise, obviously coming out of the military, mate, you've continued working with, with people. Um, sort of delivering um, sort of coaching and everything else. Obviously, Mark Onrod is a prime example. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the stuff that you've you've put that, that poor bloke through um, in regard to challenges and yeah. some of the other... <laughs> yeah, <poor bloke. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for, first of all, what I want to say is Mark made me cut my mullet off. So whatever happened after that was his own fault. Yeah, right? that, game, was, mate. that was a child of mine. That was mine. a wonderful like, mullet you had. Two, well. two years it took me to grow that. And it was... <laughs> Right at the right time because Joe, I had it half grown through lockdown and Joe Exotic came out and everybody's like, Ben, you've already got a mullet. I was like, oh no, it's fucking cool as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> then it become the greatest haircut of all time again. So first of all, whatever, if Mark does watch this, I want him to know that whatever I put him through after that is purely on the consequences. Well, my lad's growing his mullet out now. He's, yeah. He started rugby and everyone's got Everyone's mullets. He's like, so yeah, jealous. Yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, I'm getting a mullet. Yeah, got to grow him out. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know what? Training Mark's been a privilege. You know, if, you know, first and foremost, uh, he, you know, I'm his coach, and I've helped him out. But we're, you know, we're I'd like to say we're great friends, and I've, hopefully that's reciprocated back from him. And I think we are. But you know, he's a remarkable man. You know, not everybody you meet in life is is quite as uh, quite as willing to do as he's told, like Mark is, in terms of like, hey, what do you think about this? Yeah, that's a great idea. What do you think about this? It sounds pretty hard. I said, well, what about? this <laughs> and then there was like one more I was like we could do this without actually having to train for it and he's like yeah okay so we started with the 5k run um, which was incredible we didn't even get any training in for that basically because we were like oh, oh if we get to 5k we'll do a 5k run and then I don't know if you saw the video Mark tripped over in Victoria Park yeah yeah we spoke about it I think on the podcast so that's the first yeah thing. yeah so that was a million views 10 million views on Facebook or Instagram obviously and then the BBC jumped on and ITV and all the news press jumped on you know because rightly so he got the recognition that he deserves you know um, and then you know we did we woke up the next day and it was like 10 grand or something for my mullet and he was like rang me he was like oh mate do you want to change the number for your mullet I was like I was about to say yes and he went ah we're on 30 grand and I was like <laughs> Uh, 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 okay so we still got to do the 5k run because we said five grand 5k run so over that one night we went from like three and a bit grand to like 60 grand in this in the chariot camp we had one two more practice runs and then we did the, the run through down at Tavistock um, which was cool we, you know I think we were at 150 200 thousand pounds raised oh, for chariot wow. on the back of that which was just incredible um, and then I was like right I love open water swimming you're doing it he's like oh, I don't know I'm like now we're doing it and he rocked up for a for, a, for, a, for, a, for his first swim with this wetsuit that was I don't know whose it was but it wasn't his <laughs> and you know, I could see that he's just cut the sleeves and the arms off to make it work when we got there I was like do you want to borrow a swim cap he's like nah mate this water ain't cold I was like 
you should probably wear a swim cap. They didn't listen. Didn't want to wear goggles. We got to the first point. He's like, I wish I had a swim cap and goggles. And I was like, yeah, and a wetsuit that fits. Because obviously you've got less blood for him, less limbs. He was like, you know, the main thing was like keeping him warm. And when we got out of the water was that getting sure that he got warmed up straight away. And with, with a poor wetsuit, you get cold quick because it's, it's not hugging you. It's not keeping that heat in. Um, so, but you know what, man? He didn't even hesitate. Straight in the fucking water. Straight in the sea as well. Not even the pool. Our first swim was in the sea. Didn't he want it, you know, and like, it's remarkable, isn't it? That is like, remarkable, you know, isn't it? You know, you know, people getting in the sea with four limbs is, people are scared enough. Now, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be scared. Yeah. Like, genuinely, I'm not the greatest swimmer in the world. And I, yeah. when people, when my mates go, oh, I fancy a sea swimmer, I'm a bit like, I could drown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I could, <laughs> I mean, I could possibly met. drown. I would be that swat as well, would drown. Do you know what I mean? Like, going once, and I'd just be like, yeah, <laughs> some sort of fucking whirlpool <laughs> takes me down, I'm dead. Neptune, <laughs> Neptune's waiting at me. the deck for you. Yeah, like, <laughs> come to my pretty That's come. <laughs> but no, so we, we started swim training. We've got a sponsor, uh, Snug Wetsuits. Um, they basically made Mark and I custom wetsuits. Naughty bit of kit. Oh, I've it? still got mine nice, now. Yeah. Put it on, it's like... It's like beautiful. Um, and that changed the game for us, uh, especially for Mark's training, because it had, I won't say it too loud, but Mark's had insulation, like fleece insulation. So it was a bit warmer. Mine didn't. He's cheating, is he? Mine didn't. And actually on that, on the, when we got measured up, we had a bet to see whose um, arms were bigger. And obviously I won that as well. So my, <laughs> my arm was bigger than Mark. So I was quite happy with that. Um, but then we did the swim. So we swam the Drake's Island back to Devil's Point, which is a it was a thousand meters, over a thousand meters, because as we were swimming across the channel, we did it at high tide, slack tide, so there should be minimal currents, but you can never predict Devil's Point's currents, hence why it's called Devil's Point. And then we're swimming halfway across the swimming channel and someone's gone, uh, Ben, we're getting dragged into the yard. I was like, yes, I can fully see. And I flashed at that point. I was like, I can fucking see where we are, mate. He goes, yeah, we need to go over there. I was like, I'm aware of where we need to go. <laughs> you know, do you know what I mean? And Mark's like, how are we doing? And he's coming up. And I'm like, yeah, just keep swimming straight, mate. And I was like swimming on his left and I'd just keep swimming into him to push him into the right direction. Yeah. And we managed to make the bay. And as we came back, we come across the bay. But it was incredible. It was about 200 fringe people up on the um on the, the road up for Devil's Point and um Johnny was there from the BBC and it was a magical moment. Um if you were if we're truly honest, the swim was the least taxing physically for Mark. Because actually with the decent wetsuit, the buoyancy, it's uh, compared to the run and the the, the next one, it was the, it looks the hardest, but physically was actually the least demanding because of like having a decent wetsuit. Water, salt water's pretty buoyant. Yeah. You know, Mark could just lie there and float. You know, so it was challenging because we got it's in the sea, the temperatures were cold, and the current was horrendous, like horrendous. And he had to power back through the like back through. And I think he was like swimming into he like swimming into me. He's like flashed at me. I was like, Mark, you need to keep swimming that way. He's like, get the fuck away. I was like, no, <laughs> keep swimming this way. Um, so it was quite cool. Um, and then we moved on from that. We did a ninety nine point nine mile bike ride for the nine 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 emergency services, trying to raise money. Mm. And we started Ilfracombe North Devon. And if anybody's ever been to Ilford from North Devon and cycled out of it, it's about 3,000 metres of elevation from sea level to the top of the coastal path, which I didn't realise. <laughs> I, I hadn't wrecked the route. I knew that we knew the route. We had it all set in GPS. I think actually the nav guy was behind us and his GPS was a bit slow. So he took us up a wrong hill to start with. So Jamie took us up a wrong hill. <laughs> so we had to come back down and go back up another hill. So I was like, you go 20 metres ahead. So you just sat down right and then we'll, we'll follow that on. But... That the cycle was the hardest event we did because we did it through the night, but we did 11,000 meters of elevation from, from Ilfracombe back to Plymouth. And like Mark and I both were exhausted right at the end of that. Yeah, I can imagine how bad that is. I used to Tough. play football out there and it's, it is a fucking hills. <laughs> yeah. I didn't think it was, I thought it was going to be like three or 4,000 meters total, but it was 11,000 meters total by the time we come back across the moors. Um, and then we did a 24 hour Jiu Jitsu rollathon, mm. which was just to finish it off because it was like we were going to end there and I was like well let's finish the, let's finish the year with doing something that real heavily is heavily involved in that's where they, how they were founded right through jiu-jitsu so it's like it doesn't it doesn't cost us anything other than the 24 hours we're in the gym we don't have to train for that yeah. Do you know I mean there's no there's no commitments so, like you know the cycling we were training every week two or three hours of every Sunday going Plimbridge all the way up to Yelvert and round Burrito three or four times back yeah. so it was kind of the run we trained for the swim we were in the sea every single week training for that so it was quite a lot of like um, time that you sacrifice with your family and outside of business to kind of achieve those goals um, plus the gym injury gym, 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 gym training as well because we were training doing our S&C every week as well so yeah mate tell us about that because I've seen uh, various clips of you training Mark in the gym and some of the fucking ways that you innovate uh, to try and obviously strengthen him up with, with just the one limb it's, it's 
awesome, man. Yeah. How did you, how did you, where did you even start with, with, with sort of the S&C stuff? A great question on where we start is uh, basically Mark came to me and was like, can you help me train for Invictus, which is like the, um, like similar to Paralympic Games, but for the military guys. And I was like, yeah, of course. I'm like, ah, shit, I ain't got a fucking clue. <laughs> yeah. Like, what do I do? He's only got one arm. Like, how do I train him? I can't, can't skip, can't deadlift, can't do this. And I was just racking my brains for like a week of like, what can I do? So I basically got a whiteboard. I wrote down every single exercise that I thought we could possibly do. And we basically spent like two or three sessions. I was like, deadlifting, no. Box jumps, no. And then all of a sudden we started getting a formula of what exercises would work. And then I started going, well, actually you can deadlift. We've not tried a hex bar with your prosthetic arm on your stubbies. And then we're like, oh, cool. So that started working. So some of the exercises that we initially crossed off actually started working. Yeah. So it was a case of like, for me, you know, I've been doing doing it for like 10 years, adapt the train and adaptive athletes uh, for 10 years now. And it was just trial and error. And we made some mistakes. I put some sessions through the through Mark through that were probably too hard, but he still got through them. Um, and sat in the corner of the gym one day. I think he was there for about twenty five minutes, and he didn't move. And I was like, "You okay?" He's like, "Nah, mate, I've, you've hurt me." And I was like, <laughs> "Shit!" I've done you know what I mean? But yeah. it was just a bit too hard, fizz. But it's been it's been a great learning curve, and Mark's been a you know a great person for me to know because it's given me the underpinnings and knowledge to be able to go and work with. So say is it? It must be so different for each person that you help with that. Yes, the adapted adapted athletes because. Every, every single one is, is completely different, isn't it? I helped Vinny Manley, who's an ex-bootneck, uh, dual leg, uh, dual amputee, one below knee, one above knee. He's 50, he's 50 to 55. I can't remember his age. Sorry, Vinny. Um, <laughs> but I helped him last year train and he climbed uh, ba- uh, Mount Everest base camp with, with, no, with no legs. And then the, uh, I can't remember, the, <laughs> yeah, it was the Gurkha with no legs, was the first double amputee to ever summit Everest. Did you see that? Have you seen that on the news? No. Yeah. I think it was a Gurkha, but Vinny went to base camp with him and he then went on to climb Everest. You know what I mean, like right. it's fifty years old, no fucking legs. That's and fucking amazing. To, like, and he was like, it was. And it, look, we did a lot of training for that, like you know. And then I've got Kai Vickers in at the moment, who's a um, former Royal Marine commando, physical trainer, the same as me. Was doing a reverse on the rope and slid down, landed funny, a million times before. Everybody's done it. Um, broke his back, T seven, um, and now is paralysed and in a wheelchair with no core function. You know, um, so we did a lot, of, like a lot of training with him. Um, but again, it gives me opportunity in it advances my, my skills. So I've got online program clients. Uh, one of the girls, Faith, she's just, she came second at one of the biggest adaptive CrossFit comps in the world in America. Just recently, I've been running a, a what adaptive competition. So we've got an adaptive athlete and an able body athlete in, in a pair. So if your mate has lost his legs, you can go and do a CrossFit comp for him. It's pretty, Class. it's pretty cool. And myself, Nige and a team up in London called Alternate Movement is Craig and, the, you know, we're sort of like the forefront, four runners in this sort of industry now trying to, like, deliver knowledge, um, empowering PTs so they can help more people, right? Because, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I've been in a lot in the adaptive space now and the you know, same questions always get asked. It's like, you know, most people don't know what they're doing or they're too scared, blah, blah, blah. And it, 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 you get the adaptive community like saying that PTs are shit. And I'm like, yeah, I, I get you, but it might not be the PT. It's a lack of education. Well, it's a hard one, isn't it? Because like you said, you, you deal with it. You never would deal with it, will you? No, you know, in, in, in not not ten years ago you would. No, 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 because definitely not. No. If you got a disability ten years ago in a wheelchair, that was like they almost like I was your life over, wasn't it? Whereas now it's like we said the the world's changed so much in the last five years. You've got all this adaptive sport. You've got grassroots level sport now where people can go and train in a gym and just have fucking purpose. Because for most people like you and I, I you know, most of us aren't ever going to be professional athletes ever again. I train because it gives me purpose. And why should you have that taken away from you because no one knows what to do? and how to train you because you get left from physio and that's it you're done then you've got to get on with your own life you know so you know i've got some exciting stuff coming up in the new year where i'm writing um an adaptive training course now actually and i'm just waiting for some um clarification from a few governing bodies to see if they'll accept my course and if they do it's gonna i'm hoping it will change the industry because we can give pts the knowledge to be able to train adaptive athletes. So you can physically say, hey, I train adaptive athletes. And what that would do in time is it's going to create more job opportunities and it's going to give the adaptive community uh, even more opportunity to go to the gym because they're like, I've seen him on Instagram. He trains adaptive athletes. Do you know what I mean? And then hopefully by that, people seeing that, even more people will go, well, I'm going to go and train. And then you just got to give them a little bit of knowledge because that's all you need to start is a little bit of knowledge because you've got to build your own knowledge because right, every single human being, let alone if you're in a wheelchair or an amputee is different. We all move different. We have different like femurs. You've got Susan, 53, coming in. She's like, oh, Ben, I want to 
deadlift 100 kilos by the time I'm 54 I'm like bang let's go but she's going to have her own mobility issues and problematic issues so I'm going to have to maybe do an elevated deadlift, deadlift to start with if my mobility is not good enough so it's no different to training any person that walks through your door because every session I do for any group class you have to adapt it to meet your audience you program one thing and you have to adapt it a hundred times to suit everybody right you know and that's the that's the beauty of it so hopefully if, you know like i can leave that as my everlasting legacy to this world is what well. i've tried to create a, a better movement to get more people exercise and give people purpose yeah that's fucking brilliant mate sounds really exciting mate. well done next yeah that's I'm, awesome i'm excited yeah no we look forward to seeing more about that for sure um and then you mentioned uh, you touched on CrossFit a second ago. Yeah, with that athlete doing CrossFit. These are the questions I'm not looking forward to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. So let's start with uh, the early days of your CrossFit journey. How you kind of found it in in sort of early days of competing. So well, I just uh, a bootnet PTI. You think you're fucking awesome at fizz, right? If you want me to run around camp circuit and climb a rope, I was your boy. And then I watched a video of Rich Froning at CrossFit Games doing this workout with like 70 kilo overhead squats, and I was like, how hard can that be? Oh mate, 70 kilos. Yeah. Pfft. I remember going to the gym. It was like a chipper. It was like overhead squats, thrusters, box jumps, toes to bar, ring muscle ups and back up. He did it in like seven minutes. I couldn't even overhead squat the bar. And I was like, wow, this is cool. I was about to say, the first time I tried overhead squat on a bar, I couldn't do it. Yeah, like that. Have you ever, have you ever done it? Like <laughs> the, over, well, the overhead yeah. squat yeah, is yeah. like fucking Yeah, yeah. Hell. And I, I, I saw it's like it and I like instantly got, because I like exercise. Yeah. I like fizz, and I like thrashing myself, and I like getting stronger, lifting weights. It was like, it was like the perfect combination of everything because you had to learn skill. Same as jiu-jitsu, right? You got to learn skill and fitness and strength and mobility. So it's not just one dimensional. It's quite, it's quite exciting. And then ever, from, ever since that day, I still am, love it. Absolutely love it. Love CrossFit. I love the methodology. I don't agree with the programming and a lot of the things within the CrossFit world, but the great thing is I can go and do my CrossFit qualification, coach CrossFit, but I can put my own spin on it. Yeah. You know, which is for me, I think it's really important, you know? Yeah. And um, what was your first comp in CrossFit? Oh, good question. First ever comp. Wow. Uh, it might have been pound for pound at Willpower Fitness in Kingsbridge. Okay. So I think that was probably my first ever one. And it was done via body weight. So everything was lifted. Weights were lifted off a percentage of your body weight, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, nice. So it was fun. Yeah, it was a, it was a fun. Some of those CrossFit comps are really fun, aren't they? Yeah, they're good yeah, fun. They're good fun, and yeah, good it's crack, a good, yeah. good, good day out. Yeah, just enjoyment more than anything. So that was my first ever one. And like I say, I, was, I just hooked. I just loved it. And and you say you're still in the military when you were starting when you were doing CrossFit? Yeah, but I started uh, CrossFit probably like um, sort of 2000 and God, it's got a long time ago now. 10, 11, something like that. So quite early on when CrossFit came out. So I've been doing it a long time. You know? Yeah, and we we, we had um, Bishon who was talking about obviously the community, and we yeah. we've mentioned before about jujitsu in the community. Did you did you find that the CrossFit community was like a in some in some way a little bit of a replacement for the sort of military yeah, brotherhood that you had? Yeah, yeah, it gives you a family, right? And uh, yeah, you know, straight like, away as well. Doesn't you, it? I think you know I don't know what human beings were like three thousand years ago, four thousand years ago before technology, but I'm pretty sure we all like hanging around with each other. Do you know what I mean? We like and we like hanging around with people that are the same as us. Do you know what I mean? You know, we like talking about the same things, you know, like instantly we talk about motorbikes or we talk about fitness or jujitsu. We like each other and talk and find conversation easy because we're like-minded people. And I think CrossFit gives you that sort of community where you meet like-minded individuals that are not willing to go through some hardship to, to get better at the other end, right? Yeah. And Bish is right. Bish is, Bish, is, Bish is a great guy, you know. I, learned, I worked for Bish for a long time before I started my own thing and there were good times and Bish is a great guy. I've got a lot of respect for him. Yeah, no, it was a really good episode, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, he, he, his knowledge is great, isn't it? Yeah, mm. yeah, definitely. And then in regard to your accolades, what's your highest sort of achievement in CrossFit today? Uh, well, I got to CrossFit semi-finals as a team, um, but most of, most of, most people know that I actually got uh, popped for taking, um, I can't remember what I got popped for now. It wasn't what I actually thought I was taking, if I'm honest. So, <laughs> right. well, we had this discussion the other day. Yeah, mate, yeah, 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 with yeah, yeah. So, um, look, I got, we got to the... You know, we got to semi-finals as a team, which was, uh, and, and we missed out on the game spot by like one spot. Was it like strength in depth? Or yeah, it was. Yeah, not a lot. We actually got disqualified as a team before I'd even got popped because we we weren't training at one gym enough. So there's like rules where you, you've got to train 50% of your time in a gym. And we were trying to say that we were, but we weren't. And they basically abandoned, they disqualified us anyway. How do they find that out? Because Instagram, social media. Fucking yeah, yeah, no way. And, and I think like a, uh, I think a lot of people were like grass on other gyms. I'm sure that other people were grass on other gyms and they're not training as much as they should be together. I'm pretty sure, but who cares? You know what I mean? Um, you know, I picked up a pretty 
serious injury leading up into the sort of like quarterfinals and semifinals. And I've just made some poor decisions. Um, what you did know, you think you were taking? I thought I was taking ostrogen, like a psalm, to help with recovery. But it turns out it wasn't that. I don't even know what I actually got done for. Because honestly, if I'm honest, mate, I was sat in my basement with a bit of rope ready to go. Really? Yeah, I was like, fucking hit me up because I was like, I fucked up and I didn't mean to and I just did it for, you know, all intents and purposes. I didn't want to let people down and um, I, I knew for about four or five weeks before everybody else knew. I, I was sat down in my basement pretending that I was training to my wife and I was like thinking about it because I was like, fuck, I've ruined everything. Everything that I'm trying to build and who I am yeah. is going to be ruined by this one fucking mistake that I made that I truly didn't do it to piss anybody off or upset anybody. And I certainly only made it for my own decision because I backed myself into kind of a corner and when you're and when you get to that kind of level of competition and you're 36 years old, so you fucking passed it anyway, if I'm honest, and it's depressing as you get older because your athletic performance just fucking dies. And I picked up this really nasty back injury from a little bit of overtraining, I imagine. And I just fucking backed myself mentally into a corner and I made a poor decision. That, was that the first time you took anything? I, I've taken, I took stuff when I was a young ma guy in the Marines yeah. because people gave it to you. What, like, tests and shit yeah, like that? Yeah, you know, but, um, and I was, but that was probably when I was 18, 19. And then, that was the only other time I've ever taken anything. And like, you know, I've, you know. It's, it's, How was it received? Like from your, from your peers and people in uh, the gym and bits and pieces? You know, a lot of people turned their back on me. Did they? Yeah, a lot of people have turned their back on me and they call me a cunt, drug cheat, wanker, whatever, and get a lot of abuse from it. Some people have been great. You know, I'm only human, man. I made a fucking mistake. Yeah. And I didn't do it purposely to spitefully hurt anyone else. I did it because I lost in a battle internally with my own self, you know what I mean? And I just made a fucking poor decision. Um, and, and, you know, my close friends and the people that truly matter have been brilliant. And a lot of the industry of like, you know, like for instance, Will, where I did my first competition, he's been running some local CrossFit comps and I've been going back and just competing for a bit of fun because I kind of said I was not going to compete ever again. And I made the mistake. I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't deserve to, you know. But I've just gone back and had a bit of fun and just competing with some of the guys and girls from the gym who all know I'm open with them and people ask me, I'm open with them. Yeah. You know, I said the same, same thing. I just made a fucking big judgment of error of... Yeah. Of, of what you took. Of what I took. And, and also thinking that, I, I, you know, you just, I don't know, naivety that think that, oh, I'll never get caught, I won't get caught, I don't know, I don't know. But I've just felt like I was backed into such a corner that I wanted to perform for everybody because I'm fucking Ben Wadham. We're a semi-finals team in a game spot pretty much. Yeah. And people are expecting a lot of you. And throughout my sort of CrossFit career, I've always been relatively good at it. So people expect you to be good at it. And it's a lot of fucking pressure, man. And I'm trying to manage a business, a family, two children, trying to have a life and I sacrifice, you know, us as a team, we sacrifice a lot leading into that competition and it was like a lot of time away from business and family. I guess that's the only people that probably hurt the most, isn't it? It's like the your, your direct team, like everyone else can just kind of fuck off because it's just from the outside, isn't it? But I guess because it's, CrossFit's obviously individual and team and then doing that, it's just it just fucks off the people you were probably training yeah, like, with more than anyone, but everyone else can just like fuck off, really. And I've like I said, I said to the team, I apologise and I, every time I see them, I always apologise and I am truly sorry. Um, you know, we were, you know, I'd say this, but we were banned before I even got yeah. popped. We didn't make the games anyway. We weren't good enough. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, so. So fucking good, mate, to get yeah, that close. Yeah, like, just get, fucking you know hell, what, you must mate, have been like, good. I, I won't take the experience away. I will never not have that experience. I know it's been tainted and I've tainted it for those guys as well. And I can only ever, I can't apologise enough on that, on that, if I'm honest. But, you know, I still had an amazing time and the people that came up to support and, the whole experience was fucking cool, man. And it was, you know, I, I, I love CrossFit. I I'm really jealous, mate, because yeah. strength and depth, mate, is, is fucking cool. Mate, it's fucking cool when you're on that yeah, platform. Yeah, I can imagine, mate, I can it imagine. Was, was, we were going to go up just before COVID because yeah. I got real into CrossFit for a couple of years. Yeah. And um, yeah, I was, I was going to go up, mate, and, I, and, and then COVID happened. So we yeah. didn't end up going and then it's come back and then I got into jujitsu and, and other bits, but... Yeah, so fucking cool. My, my ambition is to go and watch a CrossFit Games at some point. Yeah, do you know I, what? It'd be so cool to go well, out there I'm, and watch I'm, it, I'm, I'm hoping I'm training Kai, a guy in the wheelchair, who's an absolute fucking monster, right? He is like a beast. He's, not, he's, he's just not a normal human being. Right? It was a bit, <laughs> first of all, he's a bootleg PTR, yeah, so yeah. he's made of granite, obviously, yeah, yeah. you know? He's carved yeah, from the stone, course, of, mate, yeah. the bottom of the sea from Neptune himself. But <laughs> he's like, I do all his programming, his training. I train with him five times a week. I do one-to-ones with him five times a week. And I think that, you know, he'll 
get to the games. You know, he'll be a name to remember in the adaptive community. And I, I swear, I stand by that. You don't meet many people in your life that you look at them and go, fuck, that guy's got it or that girl's got it. And Harry Lightfoot's one. And if you can get, ever get him on here to do a podcast, he's a pretty cool guy and he's an up and coming UK CrossFitter and he's, you know, Cornish lads. He's a, yeah. he's a boy, mate. He's a boy. He's a boy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you see people in life and you're like, yeah, you've got it. You've got, you've, you Is actually do have what it takes. You've just, <laughs> really? got to go, you've just got to go and work your ass off and do it, right? Same as Kai. He's another guy that you you meet these people in your life. You're like, no, you can... You can do it. You know, when you meet a 16-year-old kid that comes into the jiu-jitsu and has never done jiu-jitsu and he just tears everybody up, you're like, well, let's harness this and make him a world champion because he actually has the capacity to do it. Yeah. That's down to them then, isn't it? Once you can give them the knowledge. But yeah, that's the first time I've pretty much spoken openly about that whole... Um, yeah, well, so it's, it's a big thing, mate. I speak openly about it to people when they ask me, but I've not really done anything on social media. Um, I was embarrassed, like, if I'm telling you the truth, and I was in a real bad place. Yeah, how did you pull yourself out of that place? I just think, like, I had good support around me. Like, my wife's been incredible. Like, you know, cliche, but, you know, behind every decent human being is probably a wife that's pushing them to do stuff yeah. and <laughs> making them do it, right? And, you know, my wife is certainly yeah. one of those women. Um, and, you know, just, like... Um, the greatest thing is like people will reach out or they'd come to the gym and like one of my mates comes to the gym he's come down from London and he came out I was like can I drop in I was like yeah of course did the workout and he stood there I went oh, go on fucking ask me he went why and I just had the same conversation I love you he's like yeah cool mate I love you don't change who you are and just and went home he actually came down just to ask and see if I was okay which is like you know quite incredible really that you know and it, it doesn't you know I think you know to a lot of people it defines who I am now. You know, I do get quite recently, I've had some stick from the CrossFit community. Um, we've called me a cunt and that on social media, which, yeah, yeah I was water off a duck's back because I am one, you know what I mean? You know, like, let's be honest, you know, I'm, a, I'm an arsehole at the end of the day, you know, I did it and I deserve that, you know, and I made a mistake, you know, but it's, um, yeah, the, it's, been, it's, it's what people say online, you don't realize how much it affects people. Do you know what I mean? When you're already on nearly on the end of the rope and you've got like, for me, I've got a lot of other inherent problems with my own mental health, not just from things like this. The fact that I've fucked up and made a bad decision later on in life is it just, you know, that water in the cup that just keeps pouring out, right? And then all of a sudden it's everywhere. And I'm like, oh man, I don't know what to do. But I had great people that just reached out to me and said, like, it's okay, it doesn't change who you are. And actually, if I'm honest, it's been one of the best things that's ever happened to me because now I don't have to compete. I don't have to worry about competing. I don't have to worry about being good at anything anymore. Did you feel that pressure that much, did you? Yeah, because when you are number one, people, you're up there and you want, you're good and everybody wants to beat you in the local area and everybody in your gym wants to beat you. Yes. And, I, and everybody wants to beat you in competition and people are like, oh, Ben, you're in a games qualifying spot. I must be quite nervous and like pressure. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, it is actually. <laughs> yeah. Especially when you can't touch your toes because you've hurt your back. You know, leading into that, it's, um, you know, led me to make some poor life decisions. It's incredible though, Al people again i'm not saying what you've done was right but people are so quick to jump on a bandwagon to call people a cunt and they like um who was that crossfitter who got popped years ago ricky garage yeah. right so but he's got like he's back he's back in and he's back in but he got popped but how many crossfitters especially just before that time were fucking taking gear there's no fucking doubt they the were problem, taking the it. problem you got with this industry is there's too many people that live in glass houses and throw stones. Oh, mate, 100%. Just because I got caught doesn't mean I'm the only one doing it. And I know for a fact that people that probably call me a cunt are doing it or done it themselves. It's the, if, you've, if you're a male, if you're a male and you've been in the gym environment and you started off from bodybuilding or any sign and hunter gym, I guarantee you nine, nine times out of 10, they've done something. Done something, yeah. 100%. Because yeah, yeah. every bloke goes through that when they join a gym, pretty much. Unless you join CrossFit gyms because it's not spoke about. And we don't like, you know, I, I think I'm the CrossFit lads, they end up doing it when they get good, if that makes sense. Like yeah, a little yeah. transitional period, they get really good at CrossFit. And then I hear that, oh, so-and-so is like juicing a bit, you know, and then they think. Yeah, I, I just think it's like one of those things, like until you've been to that level and you've experienced it, it makes, it's exactly that, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. until then, like, just fucking leave me alone. I'm just trying to be a good person. And if you want to come and talk to me about it, like actually speak to me about it and have a conversation, I'm more than happy rather than just calling someone an arsehole online is... <laughs> For me, that's what they like, though, isn't it? Or, or, just, or, not, or just, like, you go walk up to them to say, oh, you know, speak to someone and say, apologise to them or something, and they just don't look at you and walk away. I'm like, fucking hell, grow up, man. Is that, have you had that? Yeah. No fucking way. Yeah. That's, there you go, what can you do? Yeah. We, we live and learn, and I've learned probably one of the most valuable lessons in my life that I've learned who my true friends are, and I've learned what my true purpose is. It wasn't competing. 
wasn't being an athlete. And mate, and, and just in this conversation alone, I think we've had enough redeeming things that you're doing, mate, for that not to fucking define you one bit. So appreciate so, that. Yeah, fucking mate. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your gym then, mate, Pantheon. So yeah. um, obviously doing some good things down there with Reorg and obviously it's talked about CrossFit. So how's that been running the gym? Tough. Mm. Tough economic climates, right? To own a building the same as size as mine and having people that want to get fed from working from you and trying to get fed yourself, right? It's, uh, it's, it's challenging. Love it. Don't get me wrong. I wouldn't change it for uh, for the world, but we, we, you know, we're in a good place. I'm not hemorrhaging money. I'm, I've got a V8. I've got a tax bill to pay at the end of the year, which is a positive thing, right? So made, <laughs> I've made some money, so the government want more off me, you know? Um, for me, it's everything I've ever wanted to do. And it, it really personifies who I am as a person. Like that, that is my safe space. That is where I love being. Um, I love coaching. I love the atmosphere. I love the people that come and train. I, I love it all. You know, I, tr I truly actually mean that. And if I won the Euro Millions tomorrow, I'd have the gym for free and I'd still coach. My wife would still be nagging me not to be at the gym as much. I'd probably guarantee it, even if I didn't have to be there. You know, and I just think of one of those things that when you are truly passionate about something, it it it, it is good. It's, it's challenging. We've got three now. So we've got myself and Dan Northmore have opened one out in um, Kingsbridge Way. Kingsbridge Way is like Avon Mill, uh, Lord as well. So we've got a little pop-up gym there couple of thousand square foot jujitsu crossfit dan's doing a great job over there and we've just opened one up now with um live well southwest okay brilliant. so like a subsidiary in nhs yeah. for context um so we've got like a little corporate contract there running a gym for their hq and their employees which is i'm really excited that's about. cool isn't it yeah, yeah it's really cool. really cool well ba basically long story short is we started doing pantheon reset in the park so we're talking about mental health we're talking about the wait list so myself and proven lice plymouth and live well have all come up to this sort of plan of like doing free fizz in the free fizz for people at Victoria Park. And we ran a three month pilot and we had like between 12 and 15 people come in. Some people went back to employment. Some of these people had written these letters like, this is the first positive male person I've ever met in my life. Some of these women were like, you know, from quite traumatic backgrounds and, you know, we delivered some products and someone went back to work. Someone was still training at the gym. And ultimately we did touch on some people's lives for a very short period of time because we really had a short amount of funding. So we're trying to get this reset up and running. I've gone to this board of directors meeting at Livewell to talk about reset. Didn't really know what I was going in for. A pair of tracksuit bottoms. I didn't have any shoes on. I had <laughs> curtains at the time. So I look absolute. I wore a panty and t-shirt. You know what I mean? I look like an absolute mess. I walked up in this room and there's a board of directors, a table, 20 people. I was like, oh, shit. Alison's introduced me to one of the doctors and I've stood up. I was like, first of all, I apologize. I didn't un underestimate the severity of this meeting. So only long story short is we're talking about reset, what we want to do and what I want to do with it and why we should be doing it. And I said, like, you know, are you looking after your employees? Are you looking after your own selves with your, your own physical well-being? Yeah. And like, I basically called them out. If I'm completely honest, I called them all out politely for not doing enough for themselves by the looks of, you know, and this is not me being horrible, but if you're working in the healthcare and your employees are clinically obese, you should be looking after them. You should be looking after them and giving them exercise to help them out and making it done within their work time so they don't have to have the excuse of the kids. If you give them an extra 40 minutes for lunch, they're going to be a better human being in six months. I, I promise you that. You know, you know, We know the, the byproducts of exercise and, and what it does. And we've seen that time and time again by bringing clients in, training them six months time. They feel like a different person. They've got promotion at work or something like that. They're better. You, do you know what I mean? And That's you, a I, fucking great idea, yeah. isn't it? Within the work, work time. Yeah, actually yeah. Actually like 40 so minutes. We're, we're running three classes a day, three times a week at the moment. And basically, when I left this board of directors meeting, we was in there for nearly an hour and we had a 15 minute window. So I'm guessing it was a good meeting. They were, <laughs> they were enjoying talking to me at least anyway, you know, and it comes off the back of the veterans lottery video and that sort of space that we're moving into. So it's, it has led to some real positivity and some hope, some big change moving forward, I hope. Um, but yeah, they, the, the, one of the um, directors, board of directors rang me the next day and went, well, you caused a stir yesterday. I was like, cool. Brilliant. He went, um, would you like to come up and see an opportunity? I've got an empty gym in the building that we'd like to provide what you said, exercise and well-being for our staff. I was like, yeah, cool. I said, you, you wanna, you've got to live by the sword that you're willing to swing sometimes. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? If you want to put health and exercise in to help treat mental health and obesity and stuff like that, you've, you've got to live by that sword. I mean, you don't need to be the fittest guy in the world. You don't need to have a six pack, but you need to live by that sword of three times a week, 30 minutes exercise. Because it will train, it will sit, if you don't do anything, you don't look after your nutrition, you don't exercise, three times a week, 30 minutes, tidy up your nutrition by 10, 15% will change your life.
But it's still true in that the guys that live well southwest as well, they obviously do a lot of um, sort of disease rehabilitation, so cardiac, cancer, all sorts. And I think even when you're working with those specialist populations and you're presented with a, maybe a sort of exercise physiologist or a nurse practitioner who's delivering the exercise and not in shape, it's not particularly inspiring for the, yeah, yeah, for the yeah. receiver of that. It's a weird one, isn't it, that? Because yeah. it's true, isn't it? Because if well. you look at them, don't you, you think? Yeah, and also once they've given you those exercises, you're off to your own devices. There's no one following up that. Do you know what I mean? Like once you get discharged from physio, you still probably need some more treatment and exercise referral and you should be doing terminal knee extensions if you've got ACL We've probably all done it, haven't we? Where you get someone and they go, oh, I've got a bad shoulder. Well, did you do your physio? Yeah, yeah, I went for a couple of sessions. Well, what have you done since then? No. Nothing. Two years. And then they got frozen shoulder. They got this one. Yeah, quite right? And you're like, fuck me, man. Yeah, like, yeah. And so you're well, starting over, aren't you? You're it's starting the same over, with the adaptive like. community, right? They, you know, Kai got discharged from the military and physio. Well, what's next? Luckily, it. he come to my gym because he knows that I train there, and we've, we've, you know, yeah. he's a he's a monster. You know what I mean? And we've, you know, and he's just a person who wants to go out and get it, and he'll find his way. But what happens if Joe Bloggs just had a car accident, he's in a wheelchair, and gets discharged from physio, is now at home? Well, mate, there's there's fucking there's, hundreds, there's hundreds of thousands. Well, this is exactly the reason why I want to get this course out there, educate PTs, because the more people we can educate, the more people can go to the gym and actually find purpose again yeah 100 me but i think what you're doing with the the, the the employees that live well southwest if you can inspire them to become passionate about exercise and they'll 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 feed that management will feed that down to exactly. like your nurses because yeah. the goal for us is like next year is to hopefully go into mount gould mm -hmm. and then do it for service wide for live well so if you work for live well southwest you get free you get these gym sessions and fitness sessions that are ran at mount gould so on the way to home and from work or during your lunch break or whatever, you could actually do some exercise. And it's one thing that I always remember from being a being a boot neck. One of the greatest things I've always loved about the Marines is every morning you wake up and do an hour's worth of fizz. Even if you'd been out, you know, I was in Jester's until 7.45 and I got a taxi back to camp for 08 and at zero five minutes past eight, I'm out on a 10 mile run. <laughs> I didn't want to be there, but it, it created equilibrium and got me back to being okay again, ish. ish but, yeah. but always did exercise every day and i think that you know it doesn't have to be 10 mile runs it doesn't have to be i think that's a big thing isn't it people try and kill themselves and then they stop yeah like don't don't do that what do you enjoy well i, I, I like lifting a few weights well just lift weights every day yeah like just to go in 45 minutes lift weights do a basic program push yeah. pull legs yeah fucking easy just get to the gym do that it makes all the difference well, in the world doesn't it it's like luke said wasn't it just go from zero to one sometimes yeah, don't, yeah. Think, don't think about doing the massive things just make a yeah start. just take that next step you know, if you can see the next step in front of you, just take that. And it's like you say, it doesn't have to, I always say in the gym, it doesn't have to be destructive to be productive. And people are like, oh, that's a really cool saying, Ben. Who came up with that? I'm like, I'm pretty sure I've come up with that. <laughs> if there's anybody out there that can tell me otherwise, <laughs> I've been using it for the last four or five years, but it doesn't have to be destructive to be productive. You don't have to absolutely end your life or be in a ball of mess to actually have some benefit from that session. And I think that's where this misconception is that People go and find PTs and they're like, right, here we go. Let's do 500 burpees. And then all of a sudden, six months later, they're like, I don't want to do exercise. It's too hard. I had this conversation with one of our P uh, clients recently because they were saying, I've stopped aching a lot. I'm like, it's good. And they're like, what do you mean? They were like, well, when I first came, I was like aching a bit. Yeah. And well, it's adaptation. Like, and I was like, yeah, you're just getting better. Yeah, yeah. You're just getting used to it. Your body, your body we're likes it. We're trying to build a minimum effective dose. I don't want you to not be able to walk down the stairs for three days. What's the fucking point of that? Exactly, yeah. Do you know what I mean? If you were a hunter-gatherer and you actually had to go and hunt the next day, why would you not want to be able to walk and hunt? Do you know what I mean? Like you, you can train your legs every single day. You can train your whole body every single day. But there's a minimum effective dose that we want to actually hit for stimulus that actually we can be productive the next day and do it again. Yeah, well, well that's exactly how I train now. Yeah. So I'll train because I do doing my actual training, jujitsu, but I never want to really kill myself in the gym because I want to be able to train jujitsu. If I kill myself, if I do my legs way too hard, can't walk for three days, I can't, I can't roll. It's just, I just can't roll. And what's you know? the point of that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, literally, you know, what is the, literally what's the point of not being <laughs> yeah. able to train for three days because yeah. you're in so much pain? You're going to get these kind of doms and these pains in the beginning of exercise and that's inevitable unfortunately because if you've not trained for so long you're going to have these sore stiff muscles and that's just your body adapting but at some point you don't want to be having you don't want to be 10 years into your training career and doing 7,000 leg press so you can't walk down the stairs the next day there's no adaptation you're not getting anything out of that like do you know what I mean like what what are you trying to achieve I understand on their pain though look? yeah yeah I understand I'd, their pain when they first start back at the gym yeah. I remember when I was I, I broke my arm and I was out for about 10 months and I come back and I've done like a little leg session. It was so basic, mate. It was like fucking squats and a couple of lunges and bits and pieces. And then I was like, oh, two days later, I was like, I'm going to go for like a little bobble around Baratal. 
And I started, mate, I couldn't move, mate. And honestly, I was fucking so embarrassed. PT, I couldn't. I'd done this pathetic leg session. And two days later, I, honestly, I couldn't even make it past the bridge and around the corner. And I had to walk it <laughs> with my missus and that. And I was like, so unfit. So I, I just couldn't move. I just, I'd never forget that. But I always remember that when someone starts now, if that makes sense, because I was never in that position before because I'd always played football. I'd always done something. Yeah, yeah. And then I'd done nothing for like a, a long time. And then coming back in, I, I always remember that now because I always think, let's start really slow. And they're like, oh, I feel fine. I'm like, let's just start slow. Empathy is one of the most powerful tools you can have, right? Yeah, 100%. And you can only learn empathy by making mistakes and experiences. You know what I mean? They don't, you don't get given the, those those rights. No, you don't, you know? no. And that's what makes great coaches. Yeah, and I think a lot of lads, like you just said, will, will, would have always been fit. And I think if they haven't worked with a wide range of people, yeah, it's 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 shocking how unfit and how deconditioned some some of the general population are. And I think if you don't make considerations for that, you, you're absolutely right, mate. You'll put them on their ass and they're, they're out. Yeah, it's years of it, isn't it? You know, I, I felt like after like nine or ten months, you imagine someone in five years, five years and older, never, and in their fifties, or never trained. Or never trained. Yeah, it's scary. Really. It is scary. Like, it's scary. Yeah. Scary. Scary that I just. Yeah, you know, I don't really particularly care about the way I look, but I just like to be able to move. Yeah. And I want to be able to, you know, when we train Mark and Kai and a lot of the adaptive athletes, my main goal is to keep them moving for as long as humanly possible. Yeah. You know, keep Mark on his prosthetic limbs, keep his core and glutes strong so he can always use them for the rest of his life. Do you know what I mean? Because even with legs, you get old enough and you don't train, you can't fucking walk. So he's up, at, people are up against it. So if you keep training, you'll keep, being on your feet for longer. And I think it scares me. Like, I see it scares me. My granddad was ex-army. Uh, like they hit my hero, you know, bless him. But like uh, diabetes, angina, heart problems, never was sugar was healthy. Smoking was healthy back in the day when it never exercised, never had the knowledge or the facilities that we have now in this modern world to actually look after his body. And then he died like, you know, had dementia and you know, it's fucking heartbreaking to see you. That your hero that you idolize as a, as a young boy just broken down to someone that sits in a fucking bed and can barely feed himself. That ain't for me. You know what I mean? You know, I'm not going to be that. I, I don't care if I lose my mind, but I want to lose my mind and have to have the nurses chasing me around the hotel, like the hospital, <laughs> like the, the hospital, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I still want to be doing press ups at three o'clock in the morning because I'm a lunatic. You know, I'd rather be there with some worn out joints than not move. You know, there's, you know I've seen people like that stage of life. There's no, there's no life. No, mate. No, that's my way to go. Can we go back to the uh, the reset that you that you said you did? Yeah. Because I, I wasn't too familiar with that. So what, what exactly is that? So basically, Panther and Reset was, the idea was that we create this safe environment for people to come do exercise in the park, not at a gym. So they didn't have that fearful factor of yeah. going to a facility because sometimes going to a gym is hard, right? Even when I go abroad, you get flutters. When you go to another jiu-jitsu gym and you haven't rolled with any of the blue bats, like, oh, maybe all these blue bats are better than me. They're not going to be better than me, but... I won't let it happen I'll, <laughs> I'll fight to the death but you still get that nerve no matter how much you've trained or who you are and what exercise you've done or how good you are you still get these like pre-gym nerves so we tried to take that element out of it completely and just had it in like an open space out the back of Victoria Park there's a cafe and out the back of that is like a little push bike track on some hard standing it was brilliant mate and we had people coming down and everybody loved it. It was it was really, really cool. We're just trying to get the next level level of funding now so we can continue that on. Obviously, if I could in an ideal world, like I'd do it for free. But unfortunately, my kids don't live off, you know, like hopes and dreams. I've got to try and I'm passionate and I love it. And my, my issue is I don't think about monetizing anything. I just want to do it and help. But luckily, I've got a good business partner. That's like my father-in-law, who's a very good businessman. And he's like, look, we can do this and you can help people but you can still earn money out from out of it. And it's been a really hard like, pill for me to swallow is actually going, no, it's going to cost you this much money. And I'm like, <laughs> like, that, like getting scared to ask. And they're like, yeah, cool. It's helping people. The product's great. We'll pay that. And I'm like, wow, oh, this is incredible. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So that rap, rap and reset, we're trying to get up and go, running again. And then we want to put it in like places like St. Budo, maybe a little areas that perhaps a bit more deprived mm -hmm. and just give people the opportunity to find exercise. Because good I, idea, talking to you two, I'm preaching to the converted, right? Mm -hmm. You yeah, know yeah. what exercise yeah. does for you. It's, it's everything. It's everything for me. It's everything uh, oh, I'm made off of. Without exercise, I'm just a horrible human being that would probably not be here, if I'm completely honest, you know? So for me to be able to give someone that same level of love and enjoyment from something and purpose um, is like, cool and just helping people. Yeah. No, it sounds like a really good initiative, mate. Sounds awesome. Um, and then jujitsu. Yeah. So you've mentioned a couple of times 
Um, your blue belt. <laughs> yeah. When, when, yeah. <laughs> longest white belt in history. I, was I, longest, yeah. I thought it was the longest white belt in history. Look, I started doing jiu-jitsu in 2011. Um, used to roll on camp uh, back in the day with like Martin Stapleton. I don't know if you ever had yeah, a staple seat. Yeah, yeah 50 cal staple seat. He was yeah, a world yeah. champion. Used to beat the hell out of all of us <laughs> down there. It was fun. Um, most of the guys that I started with were all brown belts or black belts now. Um but, you know, for me, it's some, I love jiu-jitsu and it's something I just pick up and put down all the time. CrossFit is my love and that is my, That's what you I love fizz. I just love exercise. I don't know what it is. It's replaced rugby for me and then rugby used to be the sport I loved and I just, exercise just replaced everything. Whereas like rugby and jiu-jitsu, I'll just, I'll just pick up and put down. I absolutely love jiu-jitsu. Um, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's just a, fun, isn't it? It's just fun. <laughs> and, and, I like the what it does to friendship groups and the community they builds, and you can't go through some fucking toughness to actually earn a promotion. You've actually got to like us being to a, a guy that's on the real plan at the moment. Is a copper Andy, and we we're just saying about how he's finding it hard as white belt. I was like, yeah, of course, dude. You're at the bottom of everybody. I said, but this is the underpinnings foundation of when someone in six months' time you're on top of, you're gonna have a little bit of empathy going hey, I know what it's like to be down there and you can pass this advice on to them and so on and so on and so on and it gets passed down, doesn't it? You know what I mean? It doesn't change the fact that you've got to suffer to be able to give that advice. You've got to go through the hard stuff. You can't just say that you can suffer without suffering and it's a sport where you only get out what you put in. You can't cheat it. Oh no, fucking hell. It doesn't matter how fit you think you are. Like, you know what I mean? I, you know, I, I back myself that I'm fitter than every single bloke who does jiu-jitsu at my gym. 100% and I could probably lift more weight than all of them but they still all fuck me up <laughs> in, in the layman's yeah. terms you know what I mean you know and I just, I just I love it I've been in I was a white belt until 2011 till 2020 um, 22 so I got promoted last year I did like did a whole year's worth of jiu-jitsu competed at Devon Open did the Reorg Open um, and then I've rolled I put my gear on three times this year so far. And that, was, that was Saturday. I got back on the mats for the first time because Jimmy came down, did a seminar. Uh, which, uh, you know, I, as soon as I'm on the mats and I'm rolling, I remember why I love it. Yeah. So I'm hoping that next year I'll try and get Better back. motivation to get back yeah, on the mats. Yeah, I want to get back on the mats. I'd like to try and, you know, maybe get to the ranks of purple belt one day. You know, but for me, um, I, just in, I just enjoy the concept of the martial arts. It's just fun. Pretty lucky. Like right? We've got the longest ever purple belt and then the longest, longest ever, ever white, white belt. belt. Yeah, it's class. Yeah. 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 Continue. Yeah, I was I was rolling at white belt comp and people were like, yeah, a white belt. I was like, how long have you been to jiu-jitsu for? I was like, well, six months properly, but yeah. since 2011. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I used to say that I've been training for sort of 15, 17 years, and now I was going to say I started that long. Ago. Yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah. yeah. consistency training. is my issue of, with jiu-jitsu. Is like, oh, like when I got the when the blue belt, I was like rolling three times a week, and I was like. Roll, like loving it, you know what I mean? Then, and then since you got that, you fucked off. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I'm, and also, if I'm really, if I'm honest, man, I'm just so busy and I like to be good at what I do. And the problem with jiu-jitsu is I don't have enough time to invest into it, to be good at it without sacrificing my training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all I did was layer jiu-jitsu on top of everything else and then I wonder why I was getting burnt out or injured. You know what I mean? And then, uh, you know, I, I'm getting old, I'm 37 now. Especially with CrossFit. Yeah, exactly. You're training that. CrossFit yeah, and jiu-jitsu. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I wouldn't I, even attempt it. It's just to learning how to manage. Like, it's like, you know, like a hernia at the moment and I was in with a doctor and he's like, yeah, uh, how old are you? I was like, 37. Like, you should be lucky that you can do nearly everything that you should be able to do. And I was like, he goes, you're getting old now, mate. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, Cheeky fucker. I'm fucking fully aware <laughs> of what getting old does to your body and it's break. It, if, if I'm honest, it's been one of the most depressing things in the last couple of years is how my body is deteriorating. I can feel it. I'm no longer that 21 year old bloke who can just get a barbell out and start moving it. Like, it, it honestly, it kills me. Mm. I'm, I'm staying positive and I'm training. I'm having to manage my training around how I am now and I'm having to learn to love different aspects of training. And I've learned the hard way by injuring myself and training too hard repeatedly because, you know, mo like most people, you know, I, don't listen to my own advice. I'm great at coaching other people, making sure that they don't get injured. But I don't listen to that same advice for myself because I'm obsessed with training. And for me, if it wasn't training, it'd probably be alcohol or it'd be something else. Do you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? So at least it's a healthy-ish obses obsession. And it is, like, for me, I'm beyond that point of just training for health. I'm completely obsessed and dependent on it. You know, I'm dependent on exercise and training for my own mental capacity to be able to live. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I'm exactly the same. I'll... I'll, I'll 
if I'm at home and I've got nothing to do, I end up just going, oh, I'm fucking a bit bored. I'll go gym. Yeah. <laughs> and then Cash is like, just chill. And I'm like, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. I just, I just find it boring. Just with it's nothing a- to do. Unless I'm completely burnt out. I've had a crazy week and I'm like, oh, fucking yeah. hell. But even then, I, I still get bored and I'm like, I'm going to fuck off to the gym. Yeah, just I'm to lift, just do something like that. Just to do something like that. Yeah, I'm at nine o'clock at night and I'm like, Laura, I've got to train again today. And she's like, yeah, go on then. And I'm like, because she understands that yeah. I need to train. Like, you know what I mean? If I've got to do it at half past eight, nine o'clock at night instead of watching Netflix with her, she, we, we've, we've had, we've, we hit all sometimes with it because I'm obsessed and I train too much. I know I do, but I can't not do it. Do you know what I mean? Because if I don't train that night, I'm like sat there all night going, oh, fuck. and I'm just like angry and I'm looking for a fight then because I haven't trained. <laughs> Weird, you know? Yeah. yeah, the injuries are tough, mate, getting old as well. I fucking, I'm right there with you on that. And I think up until 28 doing jujitsu and MMA and stuff, pretty much bulletproof I was getting hurt a lot but shake it off a week later I was fine I think 28, 29 was the first time I got a proper injury and then throughout my 30s I've just been riddled with them Yeah, but I think like you say you just got to adapt the training and it sounds like if anybody can adapt training mate it's probably yeah, yeah. I, and do you know what Like since I've had the element of competing take away yeah. I've, I've actually I'm probably the fittest I've ever been mm-hmm. I feel like I'm the best shape I've ever been in recently because I'm just training for the sheer love of it and like managing my body and trying to work around everything and I'm actually starting to feel healthy again which is which is really cool like do you know what I mean but it is it doesn't change the fact that it is frustrating as an aging male to have what you love slowly decline away from you in the grasp and there's not a lot you can do about it man there's not a lot you can do about ages and an inevitable thing and it's going to catch up with all of us at some point right yeah sadly so mate yes mate tell us about um any other future plans that you've got? You've obviously mentioned loads already. Yeah. Um, but just sort of just to close out, just remind everybody what you're currently doing, where they can find you, what services you offer. Yeah. And then kind of the aspirations for maybe the sort of, you know, next next few years. Yeah. So obviously, um, one of my biggest aspirations at the moment is to get this adaptive training course up and running. And I think that's something that I feel would benefit the industry massively. Um, and actually be credit, it's going to be a credited to a decent reputable brand, which I won't say anything yet because we're still going through all the other stuff to get it accredited but you'll physically have insurance to be able to do it which is yeah. for me the key it's the key right because you've got the backing of your governing body to say that you can do it which means you can go and do it you are going to make mistakes it's just the way that training is we've all made mistakes as coaches and maybe given someone an exercise that you probably shouldn't give them or push them a little bit too hard or not give them something that's hard enough so the adaptive training for me is the biggest thing um gym wise you know if you want to get in, you know, I know there's plenty of jiu-jitsu gyms out there and there's some, we're lucky in Plymouth that we've got three pretty, really, really good clubs, Chet Matt, Flo and myself. And then there's a handful of, you know, Danny McMillions. There's some really good martial art gyms and boxing gyms in, in Plymouth. And there's a lot of gyms, so you're sport for choice. But um, if you want to do a bit of CrossFit, jiu-jitsu, spin, got a sauna, got the ice bath, got a cafe, good, good family to be a part of that, you know, it sells itself really. Um, and you get to see me most days, so it's always a always a positive one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 it's first time I've seen all the shirt on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I thought I'd wear a shirt for you guys, you know. Appreciate um, it. But you know, no, I'm, it, the future's bright. The like, course is the big one, and I think like you know, going forward for me as a, on a personal development would be trying to um, take some more time to spend with my family. Um, as much as I, I'm driven in the business world, I kind of get blinded by it quite easily because sometimes you forget to sit back and actually reflect and go, wow, I've, I've achieved quite a lot. And for me, I'm always like next, yeah. next bit, bigger. Let's, I can do that better. We can make that help more people. Do you know what I mean? And I'm, sometimes I really struggle to sit back and actually uh, enjoy the fruits of your labor. So I'm trying to, you know, I've got some, I've actually got a family holiday book for the first time since uh, 2000, probably, 17 or 18 I think it was the last time my wife and I went away on a proper holiday so we're going taking the kids away so I've, I'm actually going to go on a stag do with some silly friends that I probably always I've always said no to because of business and training so uh, yeah I'm trying to work on me and my family life a little bit it sounds sad but enjoy life yeah I think so I don't disenjoy what I do now but I am missing out on you know time with my children and my family so I've got a prioritize that a little bit more I think that personally but apart from that I'm, you know I'm, I'm enjoying life if I'm honest yeah good mate sounds great and mate listen I think you've obviously covered some tough topics today mate and some of the work you're doing it sounds fucking incredible so mate thank you for coming on but yeah keep it up man thank you very much thank you. cheers mate thank you very much for having me appreciate it